Evening, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Good evening. Good day. Wherever in the world you are, welcome to another session of the very popular Power BI series around the world of Power BI in 80 days: a journey through the data platform. My name is Erica, and I am the program manager at Microsoft Reactor Stockholm. Today we are getting closer to wrap up the series, actually. Um, and we continue with the episode 11, the 11th episode of this series. Um, this series has been giving you a 360 overview of how to use the Power BI platform. Um, and the, uh, during this past 11 weeks, you have been able to go from zero to hero, but there is one event left next week. Um, during September, we had beginner content. In October, we moved on to intermediate level. And today, we further continue to develop your skills with advanced content. But before we begin, I would just like to have a very quick word about Microsoft's Code of Conduct. Um, please be aware of each other, be friendly and patient, welcoming and respectful. After all, we are all here to learn. Thank you. Um, our host has prepared a big bunch of event resources for you today. Um, so I kindly ask you to please check in via this link above and use the event ID 14584. I will also drop this link in the chat just in a minute. Um, but now let's move on to the reason we are here today. And let me introduce you to our speaker today, Mark Lelywald. I hope I pronounced that well. Um, Mark is a data platform MVP. MVP, fast track recognized solution architect, Power BI enthusiastic, a public speaker, and a very passionate for everything which transforms data into action. Of course, he would be part of this series. In today's session, Mark will teach you how to leverage one and bi directional relationships, overcome and handle ambitious uh, data models, and leverage slowly changing dimensions. This session is going to run for about 45 minutes with some time for, uh, for questions at the end. But now I think I have spoken enough. So um, let's put you in the spotlight, uh, Mark, what you say. Um, let me get back and get you up here where you are. There you yeah. are. There you are. Hello. Yes. Hi, so um, thank you so much. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for making the time today. I'm super excited to have you to have, have you with us. Um, so yeah, I think I have spoken enough. Um, I will switch off my camera, but I will be in the background listening, learning, and yeah, I'm here if I'm needed. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for thanks for having yeah. me at first. Let's get started. So hi everyone, welcome to, to today's session and welcome for, uh, and th thanks for joining today's session about data modeling for experts uh, with Power BI. Uh, I'm happy to speak to you today about everything Power BI and, uh, and share my learnings uh, that I've overcome in the past years that I work with Power BI. Um, so let me start with a, a very, very brief introduction because Erica already perfectly introduced my, me. Um, my name is Mark. I'm working as a data analytics consultant at Macaw in the Netherlands, which is one of the Microsoft partners. Um, we are actually active in three countries, Netherlands, Germany, and Lithuania. Uh, and we do everything Microsoft and, uh, and we implement that at our customers. Um, if you ever want to reach out to me, please feel free to do so. Connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me on Twitter, uh, or have a look at my website, data-mark.com, where I uh, regularly blog about everything Microsoft and everything, uh, data and AI uh, in the Microsoft ecosystem, and mainly Power BI, actually. Um, I, also on the side, you see something that I uh, do uh, and combine with, with combine my two biggest hobbies and passions, 
which is Power BI and Beer, which lead to Power Beer. You might have seen these T-shirts or, or anything, uh, other cool swag around. Uh, you can order it on my website if you like. Uh, I don't make any money for it. Everything that I earn for it flows back into the community with free uh, goodies that I hand out at the in-person events, if they are uh, again. Um, enough about me. Um, let's get started with today's session. Uh, first, I want to set the stage a little bit. If we think about Power BI, there are, in general, four different phases that, that we can think about. First, gathering data. Then we clean the data, we model it, and finally, we transform it in a fancy visualization in our uh, reporting canvas. Today, we will be mainly talking about data modeling. We will mainly talk about data modeling and everything that is related to data modeling with relationships, et cetera. As this is more an expert session, um, I take the assumption here that you do have a basic understanding about a star schema and why a star schema and Power BI is important. The different types of relationships being uh, uh, um, uh, one direction rela relationship, one to many, uh, both directions and many to many relationships and also one to one relationships. And also I expect you to know a little bit about role playing dimensions and how you can work with different relationships, inactive and active relationships. Of course, we will go through some of these patterns during today's session. The learning objectives, after this session, you will be able to leverage one and bi-directional re relationships in Power BI. You know how to overcome and handle ambiguous data models in Power BI. And you know how to leverage slowly changing dimensions in Power BI. But first, before we get started with these more complex topics, we will have a quick uh, uh, look at the relationships and relationships revisited in Power BI. So let's get going and talk about the three different relationships that we know in Power BI. First of all is the one-to-one -one relationship where every individual record in, in your uh, uh, left-hand table matches to one other record in the right-hand table. This is what we call a one-to-one -one relationship and can also be compared to a join. The most common one is the middle one. It's the one-to-many relationship. With a one-to-many relationship, this is where we have a dimension and a fact table, typically, where the dimension table is the one side of the relationship, and the many side is the fact table, where we store all transactional data, for example. We have on the left-hand side, the one side of the relationship that relates to multiple records on the many side of the relationship. And, and the last one is the many-to-many -many relationship. Many-to-many -many is where multiple records on the left-hand side relate to multiple records on the right-hand side. Typical example could be a student that is uh, that follows multiple courses uh, in multiple academy years, for example. But today we will also talk about relationship direction and why the direction of the relationship is important. In general, we know two types of relationship directions in Power BI. The first one is singular, where the relation only points from the one side of the relationship to the many side of the relationship in this example. The second one is bidirectional, or also known as both. This is where the filter can flow in both ways, from the many side to the one side, but also from the wrong side to the many side. Relationship direction is something to keep in mind once you start building your Power BI solution. Because bidirectional relationships can result in surprisingly results, especially when working with multiple fact tables. Think about the one fact table where you apply a filter, but at the same time, you are also adding a filter to the other fact table. And this can lead to bad performance and impact of over filtering in your report, and even lead to ambiguity, which brings us to the first aspect of the more complex topics of today. If you ever try to avoid bidirectional relationships, you can always consider to use the functionality cross filter in DAX. If for one specific calculation, you try to uh, uh, filter from the many side to the one side of the relationship, and that is in the opposite direction of your relationship direction, you can change it on the fly by using cross filter. With cross filter index, you can just change this, uh, this, this filter contact or filter direction for only this calculation without changing the actual relationship. So keep in mind, please, the cross filter will help you in this, these scenarios and avoid changing the, the relationship direction in general. So 
I already mentioned this can lead to ambiguous data models, but what exactly is an ambiguous data model? So let's have a look at an ambiguous data model and why this is so uh, important to look at and be careful with ambiguous data models. An ambiguous data model is, a, is an, an example where you have two different filter paths that leads to the same table. This can lead to unexpected results, but also it can happen when you start using bidirectional relationships. Typically, Parvia will warn you if it bumps into a bi uh, an ambiguous filter path, but if you create that bidirectional relationship. But, but this is not always the case. So this is why it's important to understand what is an ambiguous data model and what is actually happening here. While looking at the screen, we see a, a simplified data model where we have the customer table, a sales table with internet sales, we have a data dimension, a product dimension, and a product inventory, which is our second uh, uh, fact table. The product inventory just tells us a little bit more about what we have on stock. This is the data model that we will use and where you see two different filter paths. On top here, we defined uh, um, uh, the bidirectional relationship. And here you see that ac actually this bidirectional relationship uh, leads to the fact that this filter is flowing also from the internet sales to the product table. And with that, it is happening that we have two filter paths that lead to the product inventory table. We have one from dates that flows to internet sales to products and then to product inventory, while at the same time, we have a different filter path that flows directly from date into product inventory. So if we ever apply a filter to our date table, for example, we only want to see the internet sales and the product inventory from the past year for 2020, we're actually creating two different filter paths to our product inventory table, which is very dangerous in this example. Let me explain you a little bit more why this is uh, dangerous and what is the result of this. As I mentioned, it can lead to unpredictable results. And we start talking about unpredictable results. It, on the screen, you see three different calculations, three different DAX measures that are, in, that are in fact calculating the same thing, but over a different relationship. Each of these measures calculates the same, but removes one in the relationship or create one by using cross filter. And I also mentioned you can create uh, active or uh, uh, change the filter direction by using cross filter in your DAX expression. In total, it, you, it sums up to all the same results, as you can see here on the bottom. Um, but in general, the different individual values per year are different. But let's have a look what is actually happening with this unexpected filter behavior. On top, we still have the same, same set of data and the same visualization. But what is happening once I start filtering from my date table that we have right here, uh, and I start filtering based on a year because that is what this, uh, 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 this visualization is doing. It's creating a filter context on based on 2018, 2019, and 2020. This is the filter that's applied from our date table into the internet sales. We're calculating the unit cost. And unit cost is a value that is coming from our product inventory table. But while we're applying this filter, there's a filter flowing from date into the internet sales. But here our filter context is changing. The filter context is changing since the internet sales has an active relationship with product table, but that is not based on a date, but it's based on products and product IDs. So what is happening is by setting this relationship direction to both, we change the filter context from years into a subset of products. So while we filter down here the internet sales table to only the products that we sold in the year 2018, 2019, 2020, the result in our product table will be that we only had our product left, which we actually sold in that year. And as a result, as this filter also flows from the product table into the product inventory table, the result is that we only see the unit cost for the products that we actually sold. And at the same time, the filter uh, flows from date directly into the subset of products. So we're over filtering this table with two different filter contexts because we filter by date and we filter by subset of products. As a result, we bump into 
uh, ambiguous uh, results, and as you can see here, with different results over the different years. So let me show you this in a demo file and how, how you can overcome this. So first of all, uh, let me quickly show you the same data models that we used here. Um, if you have all tables in this data model, you can see the very same setup where we have a date, we have sales, um, and we have that reseller, but we also have uh, uh, more information about that. In this ambiguous data, data model, I'm gonna show you what can be a case where you want to set a relationship to bidirectional and how you can overcome this. For the sample purpose, I will only use three tables out of this data model. So we have the sales territory, which contains regions, countries, etc. We have sales, where the actual sales numbers are, and we have a reseller. Based on this data model, I created the first visualization. And in here, you see that I have created two slicers. We have a slicer for uh, the sales territory country, and we have a slicer for the reseller. On the right-hand side, I created a simple visualization that shows us the total sales by year. So when I start filtering down to, for example, Canada, you see that these numbers are changing. Or if it changes to Germany, everything works fine. I see that the, uh, the chart is changing and filtering down to the relevant values. Though, if I apply a second filter here on my reseller table, for example, I want to see all sales for this specific reseller in the country Germany, this leads to an empty chart because there are no sales for this reseller, most likely because this reseller is not active in, uh, in this country. So what might be a solution that you could consider is changing this relationship direction to both directions. Remember, I applied a filter in sales territory, I, in which filters the sales table. So once we look here, we see this filter direction here that is flowing in that direction. So everything is working fine. But once it tries to filter the reseller table, it bumps in a relationship direction that points the other way. So it will never reach that location. In order to overcome this, you could consider to change this relationship direction and set it to both. Let me just do this for demo purpose and show you what is happening. If I now filter, for example, uh, uh, again on France, we see that this filter, the, the, the other slice for resellers is changing on the fly to only the relevant uh, resellers for the given country. Okay, it seems to work as we expected, but remember that I just explained to you by uh, changing the filter direction to both can lead to an ambiguous data model. So it is very dangerous to do this. So what other solution could you consider? And it's actually the way to go uh, and the best practice if you want the reseller uh, uh, slicer to filter based on the sales uh, territory. Let me first refer this one and the relationship back to a single uh, direction. And once we've done that, we are back in the same situation. My reseller slicer will not filter based on the countries. Though, if I want to do this, there is a very simple trick that you can apply. The total sales is the metric that I have here, and that is stored in the sales table. In here, I have a metric, and this metric shows me the total sales. Uh, this is a, a measure that's created in this data model. What I can um, do- Sorry, Mark. Okay, yeah, sure. All right. Sorry, um, we got a comment here um, that somebody seems to um, have data model is blurry. Could you could you zoom a little bit on the, on your screen um, when you yeah, are? I can try if I is show it possible something. to make it? Uh, it is better, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank let you. Me, let me do that for uh, for the demos uh, now on. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Bye. All good. Um, so if, remember that we had this slicer here that did not filter based on uh, um, uh, on the actual values that we selected here in the left-hand slicer in for sales territory. Once I click this reseller uh, slicer here and I go into the filter pane, there are a few options that I can do. I can set a filter to this visual. I can set a filter to this page or to all pages in this report. In this case, I want to set a filter only to this visual. Uh, here I have the measure that is uh, representing the total sales, 
uh, as a measure in this data model. And once I drop in this, this measure in the uh, uh, visual level filters, and I can set it, for example, to be uh, not blank. So it's not blank. And then I apply the filter. The result of this will be that as soon as I filter uh, uh, one of the values in the seals territory slicer, you see that it's on demand changing the resellers. And as a result, I only see relevant resellers for that country. So without changing the relationship direction to both, I can easily change the behavior of this slicer and only show relevant values by including uh, a visual level filter with the same metric as I use in my uh, uh, bar chart that I use here on screen. This little trick avoids you from creating an, uh, a, a bidirectional relationship or a relationship in both directions, which potentially leads to an ambiguous data, data model. So having that said, please always consider uh, uh, if you really need that, that relationship in both directions or if you can use other options to uh, uh, overcome this challenge. Another topic where relationship direction is important is row level security. When we start talking about row level security, we typically filter from a table that filters the fact tables. So it is possible when you add a row level security table to each filter directly or to each table directly, but a, the relationship direction will affect which tables will be filtered based on your row level security filter. So let me show you what is happening when I apply a row level security filter to uh, the row level security table that I have here on the right top. And when we look at all the uh, small aspects of the data model, you can see that this relationship is set to both. So it will filter down the country. It will also cross this relationship there to the reseller table. And with that, it will follow the relationship to the sales table, which is the actual fact table. So we've reached our goal. We filter down the actual values to only the relevant values that we uh, allow this, uh, these persons in this row-level security role to see. Also, you see that the sales order table is also filtered because this has a one-to-one -one relationship, which is by default set to both directions. With one-to-one -one relationship, we don't have the risk of over-filtering and, and uh, ambiguous data models. Uh, so there it also crosses this relationship. Though it will never flow into the product table, sales territory, or customer table. So imagine in this case that I filter down on a country and my reseller can only see the uh, uh, actual sales for the country he's in. He can potentially see customers from other countries as well. So this is where you should consider if you want to specifically filter the customer table as well. If I do so, um, it could lead to the fact that my reseller sees all the, the, the numbers and all the effect and the, the, the sales for the different countries, for, for the country he's in, um, but not all customers, because maybe a customer from Germany bought at a reseller in France. So this is why in, Principle, this is not wrong, but it's something to consider. So let's have a look at what you can do to overcome this. Something that you should keep in mind is that an, uh, a security filter will never cross a, a, a bow direction relationship. So with this data model, it will not work uh, as expected unless we check a specific box. In our relationship settings, we can set an, uh, a feature that is called apply security filter in both directions. By doing that, it will cross this bow direction relationship. Otherwise, it will not do it. Let me show you this in practice. For that, we will use the same demo file. And uh, in here, we have a row level security setup. And let me just show you it. So we use the same setup with countries, etc. And let me go to the row level security setup. So in the modeling section, we have the manage roles. And with manage roles, I defined all different countries. So in, Can in Can uh, Canada, for example, in Australia, we use a role level security filter that should eagle Australia. And for Canada, role level security table should eagle Canada, and so on. Um, so let's have a look at what's actually happening here and how far will this relationship flow. 
Here we have the full data model as I just showed you in the example. And imagine that, or remember that this checkbox is not checked yet. So apply security filter in both directions is not set yet. We have an active relationship in both directions from rollout security table to our country table. So let me show you what these tables include. Um, role of security table simply includes a country region and a username uh, where the uh, country table simply includes a list of all countries. Let's start with the role of security table and here filter it down. So by we can test this by using the view as functionality and we filter it down to only be uh, Canada, for example. So we act like we are in Canada right now. And as a result, we only have one row left. So only the row in the data set for Canada is left. But when we start looking at a country table, we still see all countries. So let me go back to the data model and explain you what's happening. By applying a filter here to the row level security table, and remember that I just told you that uh, uh, a security filter will never pass a bidirectional relationship unless we explicitly uh, allow it to do that. Um, the filter directly stops working here on the top. So um, what is happening in fact is it tries to filter this relationship, but it will not cross this bidirectional relationship. As a result, in this country table, we have all values left that this, uh, this table has. And it will still have all values going into the, the reseller table. Um, and it will still have all the values going here to the sales table. So as a result, our role of security filter is not working. What can you do to, to so solve this? Um, by just opening this relationship here, that is, which is the bidirectional relationship, we can simply check this box, apply security filter in both directions. Let me click OK and show you what is happening here. The role of security filter is still uh, active based on the role Canada, as you can see here on the top, now viewing as Canada. Um, and let me just go back to the data set itself and show you that also this, this country table now only includes the value Canada. In our report, we only see the values for Canada here, which has a total of 692 sales orders. And for example, when I change this to France, you see that all values on the screen are changing because it will pass on this, this filter to all related tables. And we have now 188 uh, values left in our sales order table. So this is the trick that you should keep in mind when once you start working with uh, uh, role level security and you try to pass a bidirectional relationship. Now we cover the first two topics. We talked about relationship direction. We talked about role level security and uh, ambiguous data models. These three topics were very related to each other because it had everything to do with relationships and relationship direction. The next topic I want to, to tell you more about is slowly changing dimensions. Slowly changing dimensions are in fact values in dimensional tables that change over time. Although a dimension do data does not change often, it might change. And if it does, it is important to think about it, how you handle historical data. So two examples on the right hand side, for example, a manager switches stores. They move from store A to store B, and all the related sales in store A is now counted against the manager until they switched, which is very reasonable. Or will the sales and the actual sales metrics that he uh, sales that he made move with him from store A to store B, or will it stick in store A? This is the thing where we uh, have to discuss. Should have the discussion about. Second example. A salesperson switching regions, let's say they move from south to north, uh, and all their sales in south now counted as if they happened in north region. So remember that if the sales is moving with the person, that the uh, sales manager for, for south will not be happy as he might have reached his target, but now he didn't because all the sales moved with the sales manager. Um, so where should you count this? 
This brings us to a topic that is uh, related to the keys in our data set. Let's talk about surrogate keys and alternate keys. A surrogate key is a key that is generated in a data warehouse or generated in a data platform um, only for reporting purposes. It's typically an auto-generated identity. We talk about alternate keys. This is the primary key for a dimensional value um, that is given from the source system. So think about a CRM system, think about your sales system. Uh, and this is the alternate key is the, the key value that is loaded from the source to the data warehouse. When we talk about slowly changing dimensions, there are in general different types that you can think about what, what type of slowly changing dimensions there are. Type zero is uh, actually retain. No changes are allowed. Once a sales manager belongs to region north, it will always stick in region north. And the attributes in this value do, do not change. Type two is override. And this does not track historical data. So in this example, you see that uh, a customer has an, uh, a, a surrogate key value one, and uh, um, it moves from stage Washington to New York and you see that it's overridden actually. So this customer with one and the alternate key is still C1, um, the value is updated in the same record. Type two, we'll add a new row. And type two tracks historical data by creating multiple records for the same alternate key. Remember the alternate key was the key that was given in the source system. So if we have a customer uh, uh, with C1, customer alternate type C1, and it moves from Washington State to uh, New York State, um, you see that it generates a new surrogate key. So from one, it generates a new row with surrogate key two. All the rest remains the same, and uh, you can consider to add two new columns to it, for example, a start and end date, from when was this record applicable uh, until when is it, is it applicable, and maybe a an, an, an column that is saying if it is a current, yes or no. Just a simple true, false, zero or one. And type three is limited historical data. And this will help you in the first aspect that you ha don't have to change your values here. For example, again, the sales manager moves from Washington State to New York State. You see that this, this uh, surrogate key as well as the alternate key remain the same. Um, you see that we included a new column here. So the original state was Washington state, the current state is New York state, and the effective date is as of 1st of January, 2021. It is called limited historical data for a reason, because imagine that this uh, uh, sales manager moves again to a new state. Um, and for example, he's moving to Texas now, um, then we are converting this original value to, to be uh, New York city and it is for Texas. So as a result, um, we only have the prior state and not all the historical values. Um, the most common one is type two. Before we jump into the final demo of today, let me show you uh, and tell you a little bit more about the considerations to make um, when, once we work with slowly changing dimensions. Always go back to your requirements first. What does your end user need you to do? And why and do, do you want to track uh, historical data or not? So let's say if the salesperson moves from uh, Washington State to New York State, all our historical sales uh, still reported in the original region. So at the moment that the sales was made. If yes, which is the most likely answer, then you're in luck because Power BI already handles this type, type, type two slowly changing dimensions automatically uh, once you set up your data model correctly. If not, are you really sure about that? Because this can lead to confusing situations and, and unhappy sales managers, for example, as you might take away their sales, so to say. If you move from the region south to the region north, the sales manager will take his sales with him uh, to the different region. Um, either use type one slowly ch changing dimension to just overwrite and don't track any historical data or handle uh, some changes in the source or data transformation step, for example, by using the user relationship functionality index. Alternatively, 
alternatively, uh, you can do this with calculation groups. And calculation groups is a new uh, feature in Power BI, uh, or relatively new, that I want to introduce to you. Calculation groups um, eases the type of calculations that you want to make and addresses issues in complex models where there are pro pro prolifications of redundant measures using the same calculation. Typical example is time-based uh, calculations. So you want to calculate the sales, but also the sales year to date and sales uh, month to date, sales uh, uh, quarter to date, etc. cetera. Um, and as a result, you continue typing that sum sales, uh, uh, sales amount, uh, that part of the measure, you continue typing it over and over again. Um, well, you're not only doing this for your sales metrics, but also for your product inventory, et cetera. So this uh, uh, context that you're giving it, the time uh, functions like month to date, quarter to date, year to date, is what you can put in a uh, uh, calculation group. It provides you uh, a way to change the type of calculation without adding another measure. Let's jump in, into a final, final demo of today and show you how to handle slowly changing dimensions uh, in Power BI Desktop. So in here, I took the example of uh, uh, a very simplified data model. Let me zoom this in a little bit. Um, where we have our sales table, um, which contains the total sales uh, in, a, in a region, we have an employee and we have a date dimension. In this case, we use the example where an employee is changing from region A to region B. Um, we also have the sales territory here, which is uh, related to the sales uh, employee, but let's have a look. This is the, uh, the table that we have. So we have four uh, or three different persons. We have Julian, Linda, Shu, and again, Linda, because Linda is the one that's gonna move. Linda is moving from region Southwest to region Central. And you can see that here by, uh, let me just go to the original table and show you that here. We can see that as uh, um, her employee ID remains the same um, in the alternate ID, so the original value that is coming from the data source. And you can see that right here, because here we have the alternate uh, ID uh, at 1002, and here we have 1002 again. But you can see here as well that the employee ID, so the surrogate key, the one generated in our data platform, is actually updating. So you can see that here it has uh, uh, 282 and here it is 284. So this value is actually updating in our data warehouse. As I already suggested, you see also that uh, the value, the start and end date are updated. So you can see that this record was applicable from the 1st of January, 2019 up till the 4th of January, 2019. And it is not the current record. So it shows a zero here. Though we are far beyond the face of January 2019. So this is our current record at this moment. For all current records, we can leave the end date empty. So here you see it's empty, here you see it, and here you see it. Um, let me show you how you can work with this in Power BI. I'll zoom out again and go back to our visual. On the bottom, I simply created a visualization that shows the sales, uh, um, uh, it's a line chart that shows us the total sales amount. Um, and on the axis, we have the dates. We only have one year of data here and only a few days actually. So, so far we see a trend line for Central and we see a, a trend line for Southwest. So let's see what is happening automatically once we add the uh, employee to it. So here we take the name of our sales representative and, and drop that in the legend. So I picked the, the name of the, the employee and drop it in the legend field here. And you see that actually while Linda is moving as of this, uh, the 5th of January, you see that her trend line continues here in region central because that is our current region. In the region southwest, it stopped here on the 4th of January, the dark blue line. So this is type two slowly changing dimensions where everything is happening automatically and as we expect it to happen. The, re the sales happened at a specific time in a specific region and it will stay there. It will not move with the sales manager or employee to the, the new region. 
But this only works while we leverage this connection, this uh, um, relationship. So in our sales table, we have an employee ID. And at the same time, we have that employee ID in our uh, uh, dimensional table. This employee ID is the surrogate key that is generated for us in the data warehouse. Um, so this is not the employee ID as an alternate key that is coming from our original data source because that's the one we have here. And this is where we generated the uh, um, uh, inactive relationship. So in our sales table here, let me go to the sales table. We have a current employee ID at the moment that the sales happened. And you see, for example, that the employee ID here was 282, but here it changed to 283. So it, it did generate the current sales uh, employee ID, um, and it's connecting to um, the employee ID as a surrogate key in our employee table. So how do you do this with um, uh, calculation groups? If you're not familiar with calculation groups, you need a third party tool in order to create them. You cannot create calculation groups in Power BI Desktop. You need Tabular Editor in order to do this. Here you see that I have a slicer showing current and historical. Um, which which allows you to add a flexibility to your user if they want to count the sales to the current employee ID or to the historical employee ID. In other words, we're switching the relationship to use the active relationship or the inactive one. In order to do that, um, we use the DEX expression here. Uh, and let me zoom in that as well. And we do that by using use relationship. And use relationship, here you can define the relationship to be used for this specific calculation. If the relationship is inactive, which it is in this case, employee ID to current employee ID, it's the inactive relationship, it will make it active for this calculation only. And by simply swapping here from current to historical, you see that the lines are changing. Remember that Linda switched uh, uh, to the different region as of the 5th of January. So we see that this is a trend if we track historical sales analysis. And if you look at the current location, you can see that actually the line here is far, up, far more up for the 4th of January and uh, uh, further down below for um, uh, the 4th of January in uh, the region central. So actually, you see these numbers changing as we go. So how do you create a um, uh, calculation group here? As an external tool, if you install Tableau Editor uh, on your computer, it's a separate tool that you need separate installation. You can just spin up Tableau Editor here. Um, I see a question in the chat already. Third-party tools for creating uh, calculation groups is free. If you use Tableau Editor 2, it is a free tool, which looks like this. If you use Tableau Editor 3, which is the newer version with a more fancy look and feel and more advanced features, that is a paid uh, uh, paid product. Uh, I will show you how to do it with Tableau Editor 2, as this is the free version. Um, external tools allow you to check into your, uh, uh, your data model in Power BI, make changes to this data model, and save it back to Power BI. Um, so if I go in here, I see all the tables that I have in this uh, uh, data set. And I have a, a, a table that is called region to use. And in here, you see a calculation items. If you want to create them for the first time, you can simply do a right click and you can say, create a calculation item. Um, if I create a calculation item, I can define different values that can happen and can be uh, 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 the case. And for example, here with historical and current. I do not define the actual measure in here because here I just say, pick the selected measure that the user dropped into this uh, uh, calculation field and show it as is. If I look at current, I wanted to activate that inactive relationship. So here I can see, pick the selected measure um, and then use relationship and activate employee ID to the current employee ID by leveraging the use relationship index. 
once I've done this and I created this uh, cal uh, this calc uh, um, uh, calculation group, I need to save this back to my data model. I can simply do that by clicking this small save icon here, and it saves the changes back to Power BI. When I'm back in Power BI, I can do this visual. I can just simply create that here by just dropping in the normal uh, value that I use for total sales amount. So that's just a regular uh, measure that I created, which is showing me um, the total sales. Um, now let me show you the, just the, the sum of sales sales amount. Um, because I make it, I choose here for current or historical as a slicer on my page, which is coming from this uh, sales territory, or sorry, from the region to use the calculation group. It is filling this uh, um, uh, selected measure field with the total sales and changing on the fly whether to use or not to use the, uh, uh, the use relationship feature. So this is where calculation groups come in useful uh, to change this and leverage it for slowly changing dimensions. Uh, Steven is also mentioning in the chat, uh, also Total Editor 2 has a portable version if you require admin access to install it on your computer. That's true. Um, Total Editor 2, you can spin it up without installing it on your computer, so the portable version, uh, which is a good thing indeed if your computer is blocked by uh, admins uh, and you cannot install software yourself. Um, with that, I want to finish off this latest demo and run into uh, uh, the wrap-up and resources that I wanted to share with you. As a short wrap-up, I want to encourage once more, uh, or want to, to tell you once more, always use a star schema or a snowflake schema as a data model for Power BI. This will definitely help you to get the best out of Power BI with the best performance uh, and avoid uh, strange situations with many too many relationships, etc. Please be careful with leveraging bidirectional relationships because this can lead to unsurprising, uh, to surprisingly results and avoid ambiguous data models. So these two are related together. Be careful with bidirectional because you can create ambiguous data models. And consider slowly changing dimensions for historical reporting. Um, and make sure that it meets your uh, business requirements if you want to track the history or not. Um, I told you a little bit about the different types of slowly changing dimensions and the resources will also include links to more uh, uh, content about these different types and how to handle them. Um, the resources, I showed them here on the screen, but Erica also put them in, uh, uh, in the resource list that you have access to. Um, all these different resources can be leveraged uh, to learn more about data modeling in Power BI, DAX, the cross filter function that I uh, uh, talked about uh, the different types of relationships, um, but also slowly changing dimensions and calculation groups. And if you play, want to play around with this, uh, I also included a link to AdventureWorks data set that you can download from GitHub. It's the same data set that I use for today's demos, and you can use that to just play around a little bit with the data and try to reproduce the same uh, um, cases as that I today showed you today. Last but not least, Everything that I showed you today is part of a webinar series that I recorded together with Jeroen Deert. Jeroen, uh, also known as Jay, is a program manager in the Power BI team. And together with him, we call, uh, recorded three different episodes of uh, uh, webinars around data modeling in Power BI. All of them are available on demand, and uh, you can find them at uh, uh, aka.ms uh, slash data modeling webinar episodes and then the number of the episode that you're looking for. Um, you can, if you just sign up, you can watch them and uh, um, you can rewatch re all this content about data modeling in Power BI. Um, I see Jen is also asking in the chat if it is possible to share the slides. Um, I actually want to leave this question up to Erica, but I make it made it in. Uh, uh, the good thing for me to always share my slides on my own GitHub page. So you can always find them on GitHub. Um, and please know that also if you watch these recordings of the webinars, there you can also find uh, all the slides and all other content. But I think Erica, she just joined uh, the call again. I think uh, she can share uh, the slides as well somewhere. 
Yes, um, actually, yeah. no, unfortunately, the PowerPoint right. and PDFs, I can't share. Um, if, if you'd like, if you'd like to have that, Jan Wang, um, then you need to, you need to get in touch with Mark uh, himself via, I don't know, social media, and then you need to change, um, ex you know, exchange email addresses or whatnot, but um, yeah. I personally cannot give these things out only links that is already included in the in the event resources that mark has just went through yeah. well, what i can tell you if you look at the third webinar uh, here and if you register for that the resources of this webinar include the, the uh, roughly this deck it's slightly different including demo files because also aziz is now asking for the demo files those are also in there um and other than that, uh, have a look at my GitHub. If you go to github.com and search for my name, um, you will find all my slides and resources there as well. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we do have a few questions here. I don't know. Did you? Did I miss? My, my kids uh, were banging on the door here, so I, I missed a couple of minutes here on the on on um, on, on your uh, talking. But did you? Did you answer these questions? Uh, I think there were a few questions that I did answer, which was about third-party tools for creating calculation groups. If it's free, uh, yes. Yeah. The Terminal Editor 2 is for free. Terminal Editor 3 is a paid uh, pricing model. Um, so that one, uh, uh, yeah, depending on if you go for two or three. If you go for two, uh, you're good to go. You can download that from TerminalEditor.com. If you go for three, uh, uh, that's a paid pricing model, and I don't remember the prices by heart, but have a look at their website. Um, and Stephen also shared something about Tableau Editor 2, uh, which has a portable version, um, and that's indeed true. Uh, if you don't have admin permissions on your computer to install Tableau Editor 2, uh, or three. Uh, Tableau Editor 2 has a uh, portable version which you can just run as you go and you don't need to install it. And I think the other two questions about slides and demo files we already covered. Yeah. I know. But if there are any other questions, yes. I'm more than happy to, share, to answer them. Yeah, so um, guys, if you, if you have questions, ask. Now or never, as I always say. Um, but yes, thank you so much for uh, Mark as well that you shared your um, contact details so the guys can uh, reach out to you personally um, for for the resources. Um, so yeah, come on, guys, ask your questions. Um, I do have one question in the meantime. Um, you seem quite young, <laughs> if I if I may say that. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I don't want to ask your, your actual age, but you just see, oh, or no, you I, keep it very, very well. Um, uh, but just, you're not the only one saying that, actually. So I always make it a game. Uh, I let you guess how old I am. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed, I, I'm, I don't I'm, know. I'm only 26 years old. Uh, but I, I, mean, I was going to say 27. Oh, right, that's close. Oh, close I was going to say. Oh. But uh, okay, but after anyhow. my studies, I already started working. So I'm working with Power BI actually since the beginning. I always say I started with Power BI when it turned from green to yellow. So when it was separated from SharePoint, before first well, it was an integration in SharePoint, and then it had a green logo. And when it converted to be a product on its own, on its own it got a yellow logo. So that's the moment I started working with Power BI, which is five or six years ago. Um, that's when I finished my studies and my internship and started as a, a Power BI consultant or data analytics consultant. Great, great. So you've been you've been in the game forever almost. <laughs> ever ever, ever Power BI, since yeah. Power BI, almost. Yes, yeah. I, that's what I mean. Um, but um, yeah, so this there is a question I always ask my my uh, speakers in this series. So as you know, this the the whole concept of this was like to go from very beginner, zero mm -hmm. knowledge. To, to advanced content. Do you have some kind of, yeah, some some tips, some secret sauce, I don't know, um, that you would like to share with, with the audience? Something that really made made it easier for you? Um, something that allowed you to, to be such successful in the in this topic? Yeah, I, I think there are a few very good resources that I uh, used, but also still use. Uh, 
uh, myself to, to keep up to date with everything Power BI. As you might know, Power BI updates every month uh, with new features and whatever they release. Um, so they keep on changing the products based on the feedback that we as users give uh, uh, to the Power BI team, to, the, to Microsoft. But what is important is to keep up to date with all these changes. And what you can do is, of course, uh, uh, be active on, on the Power BI community. If you go to powerbi.com uh, dash community, you can sign up there for free and have interactions with like-minded people on the community. Uh, if you ever have questions, you drop it in there. It's a very, very active community and people are willing to answer your questions there. Um, it's also the monthly blog where they share all new announcements and all updates of Power BI. It's also on powerbi.com. Um, but uh, uh, other than that, if you're not really into reading all that stuff, like me, to be honest, um, I tend to just go to YouTube and watch some videos there. There are great resources on YouTube. Think about Guy in a Cube. Uh, that's a very good channel for Power BI. Uh, and they even do some live streams every now and then where you can just drop a note on, on the live stream. And uh, actually, Guy in a Cube is a channel that is run by program managers on the Power BI team. Um, so you have direct conversations with the people behind Power BI. And of course, they are not building it because they are the programmers, but they are uh, uh, representatives from the team. Um, and also uh, Reed Havens, it's another MVP that I know really well. I, I, I had the pleasure to meet him a few times. He has Havens BI, which is his company, but also a very good YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and probably I can call out tons of others, but there are tons of videos and, and resources out there. Um, and what I learned myself is Google is full of answers. If you just have a question, you get stuck somewhere, Google it. There's most likely someone that runs into the same issue before. You end up either on the community uh, of Power BI or someone wrote a blog about it, uh, how to overcome this challenge, et cetera. There are a lot of good, good resources out there. In the meantime, Perfect. I see Thank questions you. coming in, actually. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, we I think, uh, let's start? take one for Stephen first. Yes, let's put it up here. About star schema, what do you say is better to have? One sales table or sales header, header dot, uh, plus sales details table uh, with relationship? Um, and that's an interesting one because what you're actually asking is, uh, should I have only sales header, including my uh, sales order with the total amount of the sales order, and then a separate table with which products are part of this order um, or combine it into one? Personally, I would go for the later one and combine everything in one and only have the details of the sales order uh, um, because that is in fact the level of detail that you probably want to report on. Uh, and if you take a sum of that, you automatically end up at that aggregate that you include in your sales header. So your sales header is in fact an aggregate of your sales detail. Um, so I would go for the later one and, and combine it into one table. Um, and he'd say something yeah, else. You actually I, had a model in your demo. I'm 100% sure if that's true. Mm -hmm. Let me just check that. Here I only had sales. And in this one, I had sales and, and product inventory, I believe. Uh, where is it? Yeah, I think in one of the, here I use this is just one sales table, which has everything in one. In one of my slides, there was a slide that uh, had product and product inventory. So there it was uh, two different fact tables, but both serve different needs. And then you cannot always combine it into one. Um, Thank you. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Ben is asking, is it possible to use a parameter with a live connection? No, it's not. Uh, there are actually three different connection types that Power BI has, which is import. Then you import all the data into your Power BI data model. Direct query, um, where you make a direct connection to the data source. Um, and at the moment you open the report, it will fire a query to the data source. And for those two, you can use a parameter to define and easily change the connection string. 
And if you talk about live connections, a live connection is the relation from a report to a data set. And this data set can be in Power BI or it can be in uh, analysis services, for example. So this does not connect to a data source, but to the model itself. It's a connection between the model and the report. Oh, actually, he has an addition to the question. Uh, and question not addition. A composite, not a composite model uh, means uh, a combination of import and direct query in a single data model. And a uh, composite model you can use in, uh, um, well, it is probably known uh, the most for uh, the feature that is officially called direct query to Power BI data sets and analysis services. It's way too long, but uh, they made the abbreviation composite models. As you combine direct query there, you start using a direct query connection to your uh, uh, existing Power BI data set or existing analysis services data set. Um, and if you refer to that ban, um, if you, I'm not 100% sure if you can leverage parameters there. If, if not, I think it's not, to be honest. This, this is actually great feedback, and uh, um, I think this is something that you should post on ideas.parabi.com, uh, because if you have an idea like this, if you post it on ideas.parabi.com, uh, this is a great resource for the program managers also to see uh, uh, what's important for the users. Um, and I see also Aziz says, yeah, recently asked uh, in the community, and I got the answer very quickly, yeah. That's about community and ideas of powerbi.com and how to interact with others there. Okay. And he's asking to show the yeah, links again the, um, and webinars. Um, Sorry? Aziz was also asking, can we get a link uh, of three on-demand webinars uh, you're referring to? Oh, I yeah. just put it on the screen again. Um, easiest if you want to have a look at all webinars, of Power BI, if you take the docs.microsoft.com link, uh, this one, um, there you will find all webinars uh, for Power BI, including these three. Okay, um, and then let's move back back to Ben. <laughs> Trying to do translations on the data itself, and I want to set the use culture on my tables. Um, and not the, and the one that he wrote below, so not data model translations. Um, that's an interesting one because the data itself cannot be translated as a feature of Power BI or done via analysis service, as far as I know. Um, solutions that I've seen uh, is that people use uh, uh, translations done in a data platform. For example, you have a column with all French data in it, column with all German data, and column with all English data. And depending on whoever looks at it, it picked one column or, or the other. Um, but that is really complex situation. Typically, uh, um, uh, data model translations is a feature that you can build with Doubler Editor. But that will just translate the name of a measure, the name of a column, but not the data in the column itself. So I think that were all the questions, right? Oh, no, I think there was another one. I'm just putting this link here. Um, so to, 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 what is the community address? Um, what is community address? Oh, yeah. community.parabia.com. Okay, let, me... let me just do community. this. And then you end up here, and then you end up in the Power BI community directly. And this is where you can create an account and interact about different topics about Power BI Desktop, Power BI Service, Report Server, Power Query, whatever you run into. Um, you can start a conversation here. And I have just dropped this in the chat as well. Cool. Yeah. Um, do we have more questions? Um, I think uh, Ben is making a comment I, related to the translation stuff. I'm putting it in rows instead of columns. I think that's even easier because then you can potentially leverage row level security to swap from rows 
in a certain language to another. Based on the user signed in, if you have a table that includes their preferred language, you can automatically only show the relevant rows. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that was it I think, for now. I think we're out of questions. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's dinner time now then. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, indeed it is. Oh, I yes. To dinner. yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for today. Thank you once again. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you for all the questions. And yeah, just you know, reach out to Mark. There is his um his, his socials and his email. So uh, for anything more, as we said, reach out to him and he will be very, very happy to share a lot of lot of things with you. Um that's it for today. We have one last session next week with Nikola Illich, who is the Data Mozart, um, as he goes by. And then he will be talking about Power BI performance uh, for the series finale. Sounds exciting. Um, so yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the evening or a great day ahead. Um, and Mark, it was a great pleasure to have you here with us today and i hope to have the session with you in the future as well again thank you so much pleasure was all mine of yeah. course yeah thank you guys thank you guys bye bye bye